button. All right, let's go. Pulling up my notes. Seeing what it says. It says we're starting. I'm going to click record button, too, while I'm thinking about it. Sometimes I forget. Corley Moore. Firehouse Vigilance. It is the weekly scrap. Number 126. My guest this fine evening is OJ Koloje. He is a Chicago native but calls Alabama home for the last 20 years. He is a captain in Birmingham Fire and Rescue where he has been for those 20 years. He's been assigned to Quince, Trucks, Heavy Rescues. He is the owner of Magic City Truck Academy. And I am lucky to have him on the scrap. So, OJ Koloje, welcome to scrap number 126. Well, I appreciate it, brother. Thanks for having me. I'm very, very excited. I had to do research and ask you um, how to pronounce your name. So, Well, it's common spelling. That's it's, <laughs> cool. it's Koloje. If you look it up in Chicago when we used to have phone books, it was like Smith. So uh, it, it's very common up north. We we actually had a Koloje that played for the Packers. So. Okay, okay. I'm seeing happening now. I'm just trying to figure out if this is working. I'm not brother. Facebook has changed the, the interaction here. And so I'm seeing, okay, here we go. All right. We are live. I, sorry, everybody. Facebook changed it and I was getting no viewer numbers or anything. So I thought I was not live for a second having this conversation. So the the good part is, is after trying to say Kaladziage, Kalaz, and I, everything you've probably heard your entire life. You said, hey, it rhymes, O.J. Koloje. Well, I didn't give myself the, the, the nickname. Uh, people couldn't pronounce my last name, so they gave me O.J. My legal name's Joseph. Gotcha. That that doesn't sound very, very good. So, so do you prefer O.J. or is it is it? No, I prefer O.J. I've okay. been going by that for years. Okay, making sure. Yep. Boom, boom. Everything's working. Making sure. Get my drink out of the way so I can see. All right. All right. Anything Did I missed? Drink a Dr. Pepper. Today it's water, man. I'm being very, oh, very, man. I'm being very healthy oh, and hydrating. My broke my heart. <laughs> Super healthy and hydrating. Anything I missed in the intro? Anything you would like to add? No, nah, man, we're good. Okay. Um, I'm happy with it. Audience, get your questions primed and ready for OJ. If you find value in the scrap, hit firehousevigilance.com. Keep it going because I'm never going to read ad content here. And so, right into the questions, OJ. Um, I'm leading off with the Pompier ladder, your infatuation with it, your love affair with it. I hear it was quite a process to get one over here. So talk to me and tell me the story. Uh, it was a process to get it over here and it's still a process and we'll go into that also, but okay. trying to get one over here, uh, or trying to get one, some of the manufacturers to build one was hard. So finally just reached out to the people over there in in France that build them. Okay. Uh, got out with a company. They built one. Um, it, it couldn't come on an airplane, so it had to come by a uh, ship. So it was shipped to Canada. When it got to Canada, it got locked up in customs. <laughs> so it sat, in, <laughs> a ladder got locked up and it sat in customs for about three weeks until finally it was cleared. And then once it was cleared, then we finally got it here. And the funny thing was, when I got it here, one of the guys at my station said, watch when it gets here, it's bent. And one of the hooks was bent. So we had to fix it, uh, got a fix, and then we trialed it out. So it took it took a couple of months to actually get the ladder here uh, to to get it going. So, yeah, that was that was crazy. Did they- so once we got it here, um, we started adding it to our ladders class so people can actually see, you know, how it works and all that. Uh the Paris guys, if you're not following them, uh, you need to. Uh, the Paris, um, Pompier, or Paris, Pompier de Paris, those guys are legit, man. I mean, okay. they are, they're hardcore. Uh, even though they're military, they are, their physical fitness is hardcore. Everything that they do is, is, is hardcore. Just legitimate. So they're, they're legit. They're legit. Okay. Uh, everybody makes fun of their helmets, but I'll tell you what, man. When it comes to their physical fitness and their uh, fire tactics, it, they're legit. Uh, but yeah, we got the ladder here, starting at it again to our classes. So I reached out to our manufacturers, you know, and ladder manufacturers in the fire service, and said, "Hey, 
um, you know, maybe we could start looking at this again and uh, what's your thoughts on it? At first, one company was like, okay, let, let's see. And then they came back and said no. And then another company came back and said absolutely not. So we started filming, started really testing it. When I say testing, you know, that ladder's new for the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so we really started putting some videos together, gathering information. And uh, I sent it back to another company and they sent me uh, basically a letter saying, you know, don't use our, our parts. No, no. Hey, let me inter I, 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 I want to get Go the ahead. story. So I want to interrupt you. But just for anybody who doesn't even know what a uh, pump, I mean, I think most people probably know, but just kind of a dumbed down version of what it is you, you're talking about. So if everybody remembers the, the old Pompier was just like a saw hook right. with uh, pegs yeah. on a pole. Right. Right. Now it, it's, it's like a roof flap. It's uh it's 11 and a half inches wide uh, folded. It's seven and three quarters. When it's unfolded, it's 14 feet. Uh, the hooks are, they're, they're, they're strong as could be. They're stronger than our hooks. And, it's it's a simple ladder to climb. The problem with American firemen climbing it is we're kind of used to an, to the angle, the 60 to 75 and a right, half degree right. angle. Yeah, you grab it. Right. Yeah. With this, with Pompier, it's a vertical climb. So our guys are used to hanging on to the rungs and leaning back. This ladder, you want to grab either behind the rungs and climb, or you want to use the beams, beams. and climb, okay. if that makes sense. No, no, absolutely. So it's a little, it's a little awkward for American firemen, but uh, it's on every apparatus in, in Paris, every, every apparatus. So the one, um, with, the one with the hooks and the beams is, and not the single sawtooth? Correct. Okay, correct. okay, the making sure. Sawtooth, uh, you know, Academy still use those. And this is just my personal opinion on those. Those are so dangerous. Uh, if you think about the way that the old Pompier is built, it has that sawtooth. And the way that it works is the sawtooth catches the window sill. Right. And it's supposed to pull back. Well, if it's a wood sill and it's rotten, when the student goes to climb and they lean back how we're used to, that sill will give way. And the ladder will fall out. Sure. To where this pompier is like a roof flap. So it hooks onto the sill and the force goes down into the sill, into the building. Sure. So even if you did lean back, the force is still going down. So when people see it, they're they're intrigued by it. And uh, once they climb it, they really like it. There's some things that we have to change with it. Um, we have to make it just a little bit wider. Um, there's a excuse me, a handle that when you climb up and over, you grab a handle and it helps you roll in. Well, we need to move that handle down a little bit. Uh, we got all that in the works. We, we have a, uh, a patent pending right now. It's not patented. Uh, we're, we got to get a prototype built and then we'll have it hopefully fully patented. And we're dealing with a company uh, out west that's going to help us start manufacturing them. But this process has been years in the making. And brother, we're, we're either going to have one, maybe two shots to get this going. And the reason why is when people see it, you know, safety people just, they lose their mind. Uh, so we're, we're going to have to uh, make sure all of our eggs are in a row. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, once we start getting it out, but there are departments right now that are very, very interested in it. So we're excited about that. No doubt about it, man. And I, I'm going to catch you up with everybody here because there's a whole lot of people hyped to have you on the scrap. From uh, I'm just going to read some of them. Smoothbore Cartel, Kyle Romagus himself, which I'm going to touch on. He said, "You're live. Let's go." With all caps. Ryan Cleveland said, "We're here." Joe Gavita says, "We are here. Let's go." Jeremiah King said, "We are here." So I'm catching that. Juan Andrew said, "Stoked. Going to be an awesome scrap." Clay McGee chimed in and said, "OJ with about 14 J's." Um, <laughs> Clay McGee also wanted to know where's the Dr Pepper. So I got it right here. I figured it was on site. Okay. <laughs> uh, Smoothbore Cartel said NFPA equals no French pompiers allowed. Well, if, if you look at 
uh, the standard 31, um, NFPA 1931, which those standards are actually going into a new NFPA. I think it's uh, 1670 or something like that. Hose, appliances, ladders, they're all going into this new NFPA. But going back to 31, uh, they still have the old pump gear in there. But also, if you look at the way that our roof ladders are tested, they're tested as a pompier. You know, the hooks uh, go around the sill. They put weight on it and it has to sit there for five minutes. Um, again, it's just our, our culture in the fire service is just so safety heavy. And I understand that. I get it. But when you have a product that an entire country uses and the injury rates the fatality rate of using these ladders are so low uh it, it's crazy right i think the main reason why the, the uh people kind of look at this and are i'm not going to say confused but are afraid of it or nervous about it it's new right and everybody's afraid of, of something that's that's new and oh, they're yeah. not used to it's kind of out of the comfort zone no that change change causes friction you know absolute absolutely uh basil ibrahim says oj let me scale his pompier ladder in north carolina and it was awesome so there you go when basil yeah. says it's awesome it's awesome rich anderson said i want one looking forward to seeing this at m mafsey 100 percent dark side ladder is going to be there Howard Reinwald said he will buy them. So there you go. You got East Montgomery is going to going to pitch yeah, in. He, he, Howard, I appreciate it. He's he's been he's been sending us messages saying you know he'll get it. But again, it's we got we got to go slow with it. Uh, when we first started testing it, uh, our our test subject was Stephen Cook. He, he teaches with us, and uh, I was like, hey, if you want to climb it, we'll climb it. And he climbed it, and we got video out with it where the hooks didn't completely go over the sill, uh, but there's spikes about that big and they dig in. Right. So once he started climbing it, those spikes the dug gravity, in. Right. Yeah. Right. And I was like, okay, that's something that we needed to know. And that was on a, uh, aluminum sill. Oh, okay. So yeah, it did, it did really good. And now, he was in full PPE and SCBA. Now a question I have about it, you know, cause you talked about the climbing angle and, and how it's more straight up and down, uh, you know, all of our VES training, second story, third story, and, and ladder VES and et cetera. It's all about that angle and, and getting that victim down using that angle of that ladder. How does it affect that? Uh, that the, con the patient has to be conscious. Okay. Uh, it cannot be an unconscious victim. Uh, they're going to have to be able to uh, understand some commands. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone who's smoke drunk, Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully they're not that overcome to where they can climb, climb down. But all you're lo really looking for, you're not looking for the full 14 feet. You're looking for just one floor below. Right. You know, so you get one floor, hopefully you have a window open or another balcony to where you can get that person, uh, to that safety. No, absolutely. Um, Stephen Cook chimed in and said that Stephen Cook guy sounds like a hero <laughs> <laughs> to the advancement of the American scaling ladder. He, so. he is. He's a hero to me. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Let me get my notes back up here. And uh, Magic City Truck Academy, man. Talk to me about starting it, being the owner, where it came from, where it's going. Just go. So the way that this started, there was a couple of us that were talking about it. Um kind of the need i guess you can say in in our state for a uh, truck company work so a couple of guys that kind of faded away uh some others moved on and uh, i stuck with it and actually one of the first people that i approached about it was clay mcgee um so i approached him talked to him a little bit about it see if he'd be interested and he was interested and then um we had another guy come on that Clay recommended was Brandon Lewis and then uh, Stephen Cook and then a bunch of just Birmingham people. So where the name Magic City came from, since the core of us was from Birmingham, um, we named it after our city. So Birmingham is called the Magic City. Uh, nice. The reason okay. why is because it, it blew up. The city blew up 
within 10 years of it first starting back in the day. So I felt that it was just fitting since we were all from Birmingham. Sure. That we, we, we named it after the city. Right on. Uh, and to be honest with you, I put this on social media all the time. I thought it was just going to be a fly by night thing. Um, figure six months will be done. Uh, but we're going on five years, I think five or six years. Uh, I have to ask clay. He, he keeps up with it better than I do, but we've been going at it for a few years now. And, um, I, I'm honored that people ask for us to come speak. Um, you know, born and raised in Chicago, <laughs> barely graduated high school and you cast clay and everybody. I can't, when it comes to writing, I'm horrible. <laughs> when it comes to spelling, I, I have, it's a good thing for spell check because it, it's terrible. But I, I'm humbled that people uh, reach out to us for training. Uh, that means a lot to us. Uh, that means a lot to me. And, it, you know, this little company has taken us places I don't think I would have ever been uh, if it wasn't for it. Right, so right. that's how it started. Um we're, we're just hoping to move forward. Uh, now we got outside instructors like William Knight from the cab, uh, Leighton Randolph from Washington. Uh, we had Sean Donovan help teach with us. Okay. Uh, Chris, Chris Cummings, you know, we, we, we've spread out, uh, a little bit. So, and that, that's good for, that's good for everybody. Cause they get to see, um, I guess different tactics from around the country. Sure. So that, that's really good. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. And I want to tell everybody, uh, you're the first guest to have this, this honor and this pleasure. Kyle Romagus, the smoothbore cartel himself is fielding all the questions today from the audience and throwing them up there. So if you have questions for OJ, if you have questions for this scrap, make sure and post them in the comments so we can get them and, uh, have OJ answer them. We can put him on the spot as, as quickly as possible. <laughs> He, he easily fielded the where is the Dr. Pepper question. So that's right. That's right. That's that's my favorite. So I wanted to tell everybody that because Kyle actually uh, volunteered to do this to try and uh, increase the, the what do you call it? The distraction of the scraps host as he tried to do everything. So that's uh, it's awesome that we're trying it out. So it's the first time ever. So um, Dark Side of Ladders, man. Uh, fascinating name, first of all. But talk to me about like splicing, scaling. I mean, just just go. So let let let's first talk about the title. Okay. So where where the title came from, the honesty behind it was this class was supposed to be done at night. So that's where the the dark side came from. And the reason why I was looking at doing this class during the nighttime was everything changes. Mm. So your depth perception changes towards the building. You can't really size up the ground because you can't really see if you do have a light. It's just like a, a quick second. You see what the ground's doing. Um, so the class is really supposed to be held at like, say, 6 p.m. up to 10, 1030. OK, well, if you if you go to conferences and stuff, what happens at 630 to 10 p.m.? Oh, yeah, that's beer 30. That's beer 30, right? Oh, yeah. Everybody's going out having a, having a good time. Nobody's going to really want to take a class at that time. So. Uh, talking with everybody and really sitting down and researching, you know, there is a very dark side to fire department ladders. Uh, if you look at the St. Angel's fire in Chicago, um, the Paxton hotel, uh, there's a lot of, when I say dark side to it, when those guys are climbing those ladders, they're going into some dark places, you know, they're, they're, they're making grabs off the ladders that are not easy. Um, so the dark side just started from there. And then where it started really going into like splicing and scaling, Birmingham is pretty much under a rebirth, I guess you could say. Okay. We went, you know, we had a downside for years, but now we're starting to explode with apartments. Okay. And those apartments are inner courtyard apartments to where our aerials, uh, can't go the uh, longest, excuse me, the biggest uh, extension ladder we have is 35s. So now we're dealing with six, seven story apartments. Mm. Well, we had to come up with a way or think of a way, how are we going to get to those upper floors? And people say, oh, they're sprinkled. Don't worry about them. Well, if somebody wants to do harm to someone, they're, they're going to do whatever they can to sabotage a sprinkler system, a standpipe, 
now you have people trapped, say, on the balcony. Right. Well, we first started looking at splicing. And the first documentation I could find about splicing was from the 1930s. And it was um, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. It was in their training manual. Mm. So uh, I was fortunate enough to get that. And we started training with it. So we were taking our 35s, hooking a, a roof ladder to it uh, just behind the station just to see how it react. And then um, we'd train on it, play with it a little bit. And then finally we went to one of our apartments that was in our territory and I explained to the woman what we wanted to do and why. And she's like, go at it. So we took a 24, set it up on the first floor, I think it was, or second floor, uh, took a roof ladder and we were able to hit the third, fourth floor. So now if we were to take a 35, we we're able to hit even higher. Well, after that, we went to our uh, state fire school and the executive director there, Matt Russell, was my lieutenant, explained to him what I wanted to do and what I wanted to test. And he's all about it. So we took a 35 and I want to say it was a 14 or 18 roofer and we were able to hit the sixth floor with it. Wow. And uh, the guy that climbed that, Drew Gargis, uh, he's got some steel, buddy. Uh, so he climbed it, uh, climbed it up to the roof. He stopped and climbed back down. And that's when we knew we had something. But we also discovered at that time, if you take an alkalite and a duo, they'll marry. So if the, the butt spurs will marry into, say, this, your roofer is an alkalite. Right. And your duo your or splicer your... is a duo, they'll marry. But if you take an alkalite and an alkalite or a duo and a duo, they won't marry. Now, is it only one direction? Is it like like if you reverse them out, if the alkalite is the is the is the base and the duo is the or is it one yeah, way? Yeah, it, it it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it matter. doesn't matter. Okay, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So another thing that we you know continue to uh, I'd say uh, gather information on it uh, when you take the fly, you want to have the fly out. You don't want the, uh, the fly in. So you have the fly out and it hooks easier to the, to the rungs. So if you look at the old documentation, the way that they focused on was they really concentrated on the rungs. They wanted the butt spurs to hit the rungs. So that's where all the force goes into because okay. back in the day, they didn't have the roof ladder. All they had were wall ladders. Right. So they focused on the, uh, butt spurs going onto the rung and the ladder would just lean into the building. If that, does that make sense? No, absolutely. Because there was so nothing holding have, it up top. It was strictly gravity and the butt spurs. Correct. Right. So now we have come into 2022, we have roof ladders with hooks. Now you want to kind of focus on your hooks going over something that's pretty solid. And now you can let your butt spur just hang. But what we came up with was lashing the rungs together so this way it gives a little bit more stability down here at the bottom and as many times as we trained on this we have yet to see the springs compress within the hooks if you look at your roof ladder you'll have the hooks you have springs in there right we have yet to see those springs compress um so splicing it does take a little bit of time but once you get it set and you start climbing it is it's solid it is, it's almost like you're just climbing another section of an extension ladder. Um, so yeah, we've, we've, we've trained heavy on that. We've, we've practiced heavy on it. And there's some departments actually in Texas that are looking to put that in their SOPs. Nice. I got some questions to throw at you from the audience. Rick Huck, going back to the Pompier, of course, said, OJ, you stated that the Pompier is well used in France. Can you see it becoming a go-to piece of equipment here in the U.S. and Canada? Uh, my goal is for it to, but as I said earlier, we're probably going to get one or two shots at it. Uh, so that's why it, it's taken so long to get it going. Um, I was hoping that our manufacturers would have helped us with it, but we do have some outside people that are helping with this. Um, I believe it will, especially with some of the urban cities that once they see it and they climb it and they understand it. I think they'll they'll really uh, be for it. So hopefully, yeah, uh, we can. Nice. 
Uh, Kyle Romagus wants to know, do you recommend a particular way to secure the splice, a strap or piece of webbing? It's so, uh, Arthur Ashley, uh, he has the bobblehead. Uh, we did a truck school up in, uh, Washington state and we used the bobblehead up there. Worked great. Or just a 10 foot piece of webbing, put in a clove hitch and just wrap and frap and finish off with a clove, clove hitch. Um, uh, Recently, I did see some guys training, doing the splice, and they had a halligan going into the side of the rung, uh, and they would put the butt spur on the halligan. Uh, uh, this is just my opinion from the stuff that we've been seeing and training with. Uh, I wouldn't do that. And the reason why is any movement or any wash to the left or right that you may have can possibly kick that butt that uh, halligan out and now you're going to have a small you're going to have a drop and that drop's going to be kind of a shock to that whole system if, if that makes sense and now yeah. once you have that shock um it can possibly kick that supporting ladder out a little bit and that's really going to panic the climber or a victim that you're bringing down and the potential of falling is there sure sure beautiful okay kyle ramos has another question which is, uh, what does, what would Lopez do mean to you? <laughs> so we did a class with Howard and Kyle. Uh, it was called uh, Throwing and Flowing. Um, okay. It was a really good class. And one of the students, his last name was Lopez. Great kid. Um, I'll take a million Lopez's. So the saying for the couple of days that we were there was, what would Lopez do? How would Lopez handle it? Nice. And it was, he was just such a good kid. He was so motivated. Um, and he took, he took the joke well also. So it was, it was a good time. Nice. Very nice. Awesome. Okay. I always, I'm always scared when I, when I, I know I'm stepping into an inside joke. And so no, no. I had to be Lopez, very, very, like I said, I'd take a million Lopez's. He was fantastic. Um, Challenges of realism and relevance. Uh, obviously, with live fire, it can be extremely difficult, too, but also when doing ladders uh, or rescue. What is your advice for overcoming you know, the challenges of relevance and realism? Well, you know, our class, uh, especially dealing with splicing, scaling, bridging, uh, a lot of people ask, is this, you know, is that realistic? Well, yeah, it is, because it, it especially splicing, uh, in 1986, Detroit did it. They did a 20 foot wall ladder off of a hundred foot aerial. So it, it's been done. Uh, Florida did it. I think it was, uh, um, I have to look back. I mean, I have a, a brain fart right. right now, but Florida did it out of the, off of an aerial. Um, Kentland did a uh, scaling with a roof ladder. So yeah, it's, it's been done and it can still be done. A lot of people argue, well, it's not a realistic thing because you can use a 50-footer, you can use an aerial. Well, like you said, for us, one of our apartment complexes butts up to a baseball stadium, so we can't get an aerial in there. Right. Um, dealing with, with, with training, live fire training and ladders, we don't really use live fire. We used to. Uh, we used to do live fire. An incident happened. I wasn't there. Um I needed to vet my instructors a little bit better than I did at that time. And somebody uh, threw pieces of a tire into the fire. Well, after that, we, me and our company really got hit hard. Uh, you know, 1403, all this and that. I, I took it. I owned it since I was the owner. Uh, and after that, we stayed away from live fire. Uh, two, it really wears our instructors out. I understand, you know, people love live fire right. because they get to feel the heat and all that. Um, but for us, what it is is just getting the good muscle memory in. Sure. And I believe we can still do and get good muscle memory even without having to do live fire. Right on. Right on. Boom. Yeah, people are saying Kentland has done it. Clay McGee said Nashville has done it. Brandon Lewis said it wasn't me. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> No, absolutely. Okay, very good, very good. Pulling it up, pulling it up. Where do you fall on practice like you play and the crawl, rock, <laughs> crawl walk, run discussion? Uh, it's funny you bring a 
crawl, uh, crawl, walk, run. That was one thing that we really pushed behind our company was uh, when we would do five day classes, uh, the first thing that we would do is four century. Uh, and that's kind of crawling, I guess you could say. Right. Uh, we'd start with the very basics, get the student up to speed with um, different types of four century saw work and all that. Because our thing is, if you can't get in, you can't do anything. You can have a nozzle all day long, but if you can't get through the door, if you can't get through windows, you're, you're, you're pretty much useless. So that is the basic that we start with is four century. Then we'd move into ladders. Uh, that's where we're starting to walk a little bit. Uh, then the next day would go into different types of searches, split search oriented, um, just BES. And now we're starting to run a little bit. Right. Thursday, we'll start putting everything together. And Friday, you should be in a full out sprint with four century ground ladders search. Um, so that that's where we are with, with the crawl, walk, run. In the fire service, it's the same thing. You know, if you look at it, that's the thing on the military side, especially uh, the SEALs use it. So if you have a new recruit in, um, you're not necessarily just going to throw them to the wolves. Right. You have to first see. What are their capabilities just in a mask? Are they going to freak out in that mask? Yeah, in the academy, we're supposed to uh, see and weed those people out. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes they get past. So once they hit the station, one of the first things you need to do is see, can they work in a mask? Are they claustrophobic? So that, that's our crawl for us. So if we see that, okay, we got them under, we're fine with, with the mask. Then we'll start putting some stressors on them. Right. Um, get their heart rate up, get their adrenaline going because it's way different under a mask with that. And then we start walking. Once we start walking, it's four century, advancing lines, throwing ladders on air so they can get their heart rate up. So they're not getting that that full openness. And then once we start running, that's that's the real deal. That's when we hit, you know, the fire ground. Uh, we're masked up doing searches. Uh, so the crawl, the crawl, walk, run for us is is a fantastic way to start stuff. No, and it sounds like you start, like you said, you start from the outside getting in because, like, if you have a nozzle but you can't get through the door, what's it matter? So I really like that that approach of sequential almost uh, skills. You know. Yeah, you can have the the prettiest tools in the world, but if you don't know how to use them, it's it's just paperweight. Nice. Very nice. Uh, BJ Breacher said the concept of dark side makes so much sense. When are we making a majority of our grabs? 64% between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. with 40% in room above the first floor. So yeah. very, very. And that's according to fire rescue survey and brushes work and Ladine and all. I mean, I don't want to start naming names. So I'll forget too many people, but a lot of people put pushing uh, and getting that data to us. So beautiful stuff. That is great stuff. Yep. Uh, going on, uh, lessons you have learned from instructing and advice you would pass on to others who want to train or instruct. Uh, lessons learned. One of the first ones is make sure that the, if you got people teaching with you, make sure your core is solid, that you can basically trust them with anything that that is yours because it's going to fall back on you as a small comp as a training owner uh, if you're looking to get into this the first thing you have to understand is you're not going to make any money nothing right on. so if you're getting into this looking at you're going to make a quick buck you're not going to uh, you have to pay the instructors you have to pay your insurance you have to pay for tools you have to pay there's so many things that come out that you'll probably make just a couple of hundred dollars. And honestly, you can make more money doing an overtime shift. But if you love the fire service and you want to give back and you feel that you have the knowledge and that you're ready, by all means, do it. If you need help, reach out to me. I'll help you um, because there's a bunch of bumps that you're going to go through and there's going to be licks that you're going to take doing this. Uh, I believe every company that does this does take some licks and that's okay because you grow from, it. Right. Uh, you become uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable the entire time. I'm uncomfortable because I'm in somebody else's backyard. So say I'm, I'm in Washington 
And this is something we learned while we we're up there. Where we're at, we drag ladders. And the reason why is because we're short staffed. So we'll stack ladders. Some places call it a sled, some call it a skid or a swick or whatever. So when we were in Washington, we were showing those guys, hey, this is how you drag ladders with tools. They don't drag ladders up there. That's not in their culture. That's not in their SOPs. But we showed them, hey, I understand, but let me show you this so you have an understand if you have to do it. And those guys were really, really uncomfortable doing it. But they, <laughs> they, they did it. Right. They did it. But it's stuff like that when you're going out to other places and other parts of the country to train because now you're in their culture. You're not, they're not in ours. Right. So the good thing is uh, everywhere we've been, uh, they've been very open to our training um, because it is unconventional, especially with our ladders. Uh, once they see that we do take safety measures, uh, we do put ropes on people. Um, the safety officer kind of calms down a little bit. So if you're looking to get in this, just holler at me. I'll help you out. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, Kobe Wigginton says, what's your opinion or preference on a short VES ladder? Do you make your own or is there one out there to purchase? That's good. Currently not carrying a short version ladder on the rig right now. Uh, right before I got promoted to captain on truck one, we had a single story VES ladder and the guys made it. Um, we got with our logistics. They just gave us a out of service ladder, explained to them what we were doing. Uh, um, so Drew and them, they cut it down, painted it, make it look great. Uh, also while we were there, um, we found a Fresno ladder. Uh, okay. so the guys took the Fresno ladder, um, uh, cleaned it up, oiled it up, looks great. Uh, and that they'll use that for, um, elevators. So for a fee, uh, first floor VES, yeah, we, we carried one on truck one. Nice. So you're a fan and you make your own. You don't know of one that's commercially made at all yet? Not yet. I'm sure there's one will be coming. Uh, one's out there or one will probably be out there soon, but not that, not that I know of. Okay. How do you stay engaged and keep the passion burning? Uh, I have 20 years in the fire service and I just, I love the fire service. Uh, it's, it's gave so much to me and my family. Um, uh, some, as many firemen, I do get dis discouraged. Um, uh, I do get, how can I say, uh, somebody said emotionally hijacked, uh, that does happen to me. But what I try to do is get around people that are, are better than me. If, if that makes sense. Uh, I grew up riding a skateboard and how you stay engaged with that and get better is you get around people that are better and they challenge you. Uh, so that's one thing that I try to do is stay around people that, that will challenge me. Um, we recently just went to the national fire Academy and we took a class up there and it, it challenged us. So it was really good. So yeah, what I try to do to stay passionate and engaged with it, I try to get around people that are highly motivated, uh, that are, also passionate into the job, but they're better than me. So this way I can grow from them. And hopefully those, well, most of those people that I do get around, they're not jerks. Uh, there are some out there that are very good firemen, but they can have that ego with them also. And it kind of kills the vibe. So that, that, that's how I do it. Is there a, uh, um, recurring, I want to say misconception, but misconception or recurring despite cultures, uh, something you see coming up over and over as you teach that you're surprised that it keeps coming up over and over. Is there anything like that that sticks out to you? Uh, Especially yeah, considering just, ladders and, and rescue, et cetera. Yeah, well, uh, when we teach ladders, what, one thing that uh, I push is um, tip in the window. And this discussion comes up every class. Okay. Because everybody pushes – or, or some people push back, well, I want to put the tip under the sill. Under the sill, So right. I ask, ask why I do that. It uh, gives more area to the window, uh, easier for rescue. Right. Well, my challenge is to everybody that takes our class is just try it one time when you get back with just the tip in the window. And we're not talking about a full rung. We're just talking about just the tip on the sill. And the reason why I talk about that is 
if you're under the sill and say the ladder washes out left to right, what's going to catch the tip? Nothing. Nothing. You're, 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 you could possibly fall. The ladder could wash all the way to the right or to the left if, if, if an incident happened. But if your tip is in the sill and something takes place and the water lashes right. to the right, you have the window frame to catch it. Okay. Also, you look at your window, your ladders. They're rounded, right? So with them being rounded, the chances of something getting caught, yeah, it's there, but it's easy to manage. Um, one thing that Sean Donovan, uh, I look at Sean as, as one of my mentors. One okay. thing that Sean said was, uh, it doesn't matter if your tip's in the window or not. If your life's on the line, that tip isn't going to do anything. You're going to bail out. You're, you're going to come out. It uh, doesn't matter if you have stuff in your pockets or not. And that's what I challenge everybody is stuff your pockets, a water bottle, stuff it or whatever, and try to come out head first and just to see that you can do it with the tip in the window. Right. But that is a huge, huge conversation that, that comes up every class that we do. No, no. And, and, and I get it because I, I'm, you know, underneath those seal is, is, you know, I've always been a proponent of, but like you said, the washout, and you're not talking about sticking multiple rungs just way up in there and no. blocking, blocking the, the entire window. That's right. Just the tip. Just the tip. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Brian Hoodwin said, when are you coming back to Florida? Uh, we will be in Florida actually next week. We're at the North Florida Fire Expo. Nice. Nice. I will see you there. We'll get to meet, yeah. we'll get to yeah, meet in we're, person. We're, we're there. Excellent. Yes. Um, where am I at? Pulling up notes. I asked about Lopez. Uh, <laughs> how do you frame it when you're trying to generate buy-in, like with your crew personally on, on duty? Uh, any sort of tips, tricks that you get to get to generate buy-in and get uh, your guys engaged? So uh, before I got promoted, uh, I was a lieutenant at one. And, you know, every officer is proud of their crew. But this crew that I had um, – and I'm not saying this just because they're mine. I'd put them against any crew truck company against in the nation. Okay. That's just how good they were. Um, for them to get buy-in, you know, I'd just give them a tap. The second thing that I would do, especially on the fire ground, was I wouldn't micromanage them. Um, those guys were good at what they would at what they would do, and I would let them work. So the buy-in was there that one. Uh, they knew I believed in them. Hopefully they knew I believed in them. Right. Two, hopefully they knew that I trusted them to let them go and work. So to get buy-in, you have to show your people that you believe in them, that you trust them, you're going to invest in them. And I'm not talking about the department invest in them. As an officer, you have to use your time to invest in the people. Nice. So where I'm at right now, I have a very young crew. I have a brand new rookie with just a few months out. Uh, I have a guy that has less than 10 years and I tried to invest time into them. Nice. And once they see that the officers investing time into them and trying to pass knowledge on to them, that gets some buy-in with them. So that's one way that, that I look at, especially the company officer is you got to invest your time into your people. If you're just in the office, not doing it, you are not, going to get any buy-in whatsoever beautiful man that's a beautiful beautiful answer which i kind of goes right into your leadership style obviously uh you sound like it's very uh, relationship based and uh time investment yeah I, I try to be but another down you know if you're going to self-reflect and look at your look at yourself i'm a, an emotional person so my emotions sometimes will come into play and um uh, that that's kind of bad because once your emotions come in, you kind of get blinded, if, if that makes sense. No, it does. Uh, I had three really good leaders in my life. Two was from the military. Um, one was a lieutenant, and he hated to be saluted. And then one day we asked him, why do you hate to be saluted? And he said, the difference between you and me is a piece of paper. I got the paper now. You'll get it when you get out. And to this day, I would follow that man anywhere he went. The second leader that really influenced my life, I messed up on a drill and I said some things that I shouldn't have said. And he took me to the office and it was me and him. And he basically said he could take everything away from me except my birthday. And I was like, I think this guy could kill me and get away with it. But that's another leadership style. I needed discipline. 
So once I got the discipline from him, again, I'd follow him anywhere. The third leadership I got was from a captain that I was around my entire career, Captain Tingle. And he showed me to care for your people. If you care for your people, there's nothing that they won't do for you. Right and on. that's what I try to do. I try my best to care for the people that are underneath me, uh, make sure that their well-being is taken care of as much as possible, and you know, try to just control emotion as much as possible. So you were in the military. Yes. So what do you think the fire service gets right paramilitary-wise, and what do you think we get wrong? Well, when I was in the military, I, I guess you could say it's different because I had a friend that just recently got out. And just like with the fire service, uh, you're getting a completely different generation in. Uh, and like the military, the fire service, we hate to change. So when it <laughs> comes to our, our training, we kind of have to change the way that these kids are learning. It, you know, they're like you and I, when we went to school or in the military, everything was a book. So my son right now is graduating high school. Uh, they don't have lockers. They don't have books. Everything's on a phone. Everything's on a computer. So that's change for us to train them. We're going to have to change our way of the way that we train is unfortunately it's going to start out on a computer and then hopefully we can get them out and grasp the hands on. So yeah, there's, there's more change coming. We just have to adapt to it. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. No questions flying at you right now at the moment. So I always like to ask you, do you have book or books that you think firefighters should be reading? Yes. Uh, one of them is leadership on the line. Uh, the other one is the death of expertise. Uh, the other one of course is truck company operations by John Mittendorf. What was number two? And you said a uh, leadership on the line. And then what was the death of expertise? Death of expertise. Yep. Um, of course, truck company operations by John Mittendorf. Okay. And there's there's a slew of leadership books out there, and uh, any, one of them is. I was gonna say uh, any favorites, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, write your ship. Uh, that's a pretty good one. A lot of people read that, and what's funny about that book is um, the cruiser was in my battle group when the commander wrote that book. Oh, nice. So, yeah. The Benfold, so, I believe. Yeah, the Benfold, I think. Yeah. So it there's there's a bunch of books out there, but those, those right right there are something that we need to read in the fire service. Yes, man, absolutely. See, Michael Perez, they were answering questions there. Rich Anderson, no French truck workbooks? Uh, no, I haven't found. You know, here's the thing dealing with those guys. Um uh, We've angered them so much uh, because we make fun of their helmets, their tactics, their fire, their apparatus and everything. Uh, they really won't reach out or they won't help when it comes to this ladder. And, you know, to a point, I kind of understand it because what we're doing as American Fire Service, we're destroying their culture. You know, that that's their culture. That's what they come up as, you know. And so take it as they start destroying our culture, you know, like our helmets that we're proud of and all that, you know? Right. So no, there's no French workbook. Uh, everything is we're doing on our own, uh, gathering information and all that on the ladder. Um, so yeah, that's where we are with that. Uh, Dylan, I don't quite understand your question. Uh, I, you have to word it better cause I don't quite understand what you're asking. Uh, Jeff Clark said, I think you answered this, but Jeff Clark said for splicing, is it better to a narrow width? Or same width ladder? Uh, well, the roof ladder is going to be a little bit more narrow. So I think what he's trying to say is a, maybe a 24 on a 24. Uh, 24 on a 24, uh, we don't do it. We, we just use a roof ladder. So uh, I think I answered the question. Yeah, okay. I think so. And you talked about the alcos and the duos also. So good. Yeah. All right, perfect. I'm rolling up. I like to do this thing that is known as the five questions for firefighters. And of course, now it's the next five questions for firefighters. So, OJ Koloje, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? Sure. All right. We're bringing them at you. Number one, right out the gate, what single characteristic 
makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? Uh, the run-of-the-mill, I call them uh, basically rearview mirror firemen. And what they are is once they leave the fire station, the fire service is in their rear view mirror. Okay. They don't think about it. They don't look at it. They don't read. They don't do anything away. And I understand family is very important. But when you go to sleep, you got a phone. Instead of looking at whatever on YouTube, you can pull up a video, pull up a quick article or something. Those guys that are highly engaged, highly motivated, they're they're into the job, I will say, not in the job. They're into it. They are constantly reading. They're constantly training. They're pushing their self. Even away from the station, they are going to conferences. They're taking outside classes. So that's, to me, is where you see the difference between just the common fireman and the go-getter fireman. Uh, and wh everywhere we've been, uh, that's what we have seen, are the go-getter firemen. Uh, especially on our second half of the day, uh, with ladders, our second half of the day is based off of the Paxton Hotel fire. And it's basically just a big whack-a-mole. But we don't give you a break. And you're constantly <laughs> being pushed and pushed and pushed with the ladders. And your physical agility is getting pushed. Your mental is getting pushed. Um, so those guys that come out to our class, they are some go-getters. And we, we appreciate them. Beautiful, beautiful. Number two, coming at you. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, what would it be? Uh, what I would do if I was a rook right now, going back when I came on, I would definitely listen to the old heads more. Uh, I had, I did take a lot of notes from those guys, but also on the flip side, it's like, man, this dude, you know what? He's so old. What does he know? You know right. what I mean? No, absolutely. And uh, looking back at it, it's like, man, I wish I had one more conversation with that guy. I wish I had uh, sat at the kitchen table a little bit longer with him and gathered just a little bit more information. No. Um, we had one, one salt, and uh, what he loved was at the time we would scrub our tables with Ajax. So the newspaper would get on the uh, – on the table, I'd scrub it with Ajax and I would sit down and he would tell me stories and give me some instruction. But over time, being young and stupid, it's like, all right, I did this for you. I'm tired of you talking, you know, just be quiet, Right. I guess you could say. But that's what I would do. I would definitely, definitely would listen more to those old guys uh, because what they were teaching then is still relevant now. Beautiful. Beautiful, man. I love it. And I, I do uh, listen to the old heads, just the way you say it. Listen to the old heads more. Uh, Max points. I love that answer. What is your favorite training drill? Uh, my, our favorite training, well, my favorite training drill is, is the Paxton drill. Um, where we got that from was actually from Illinois. They explained it to us. Um, and the, it's after the Paxton Hotel fire that took place. Uh, what I love about that drill is it encompasses strength. Uh, it encompasses your, your mental capability because you really get wore out from it. Um, and it just pushes you. Uh, that is, to be honest with you, that is my favorite drill out of, out of anything is doing the Paxton. Can, can you elaborate on what the Paxton is exactly? or So what the Paxton is, it's our final drill of the day, uh, dark side of ladders. And it encompasses splicing, it encompasses scaling, it encompasses everything. Uh, and when I say it's just big whack-a-mole, what we do is we break the students up into five groups. So we try to have 25 students. One group are victims. And they'll be in windows. And they'll be yelling, help me, help me. And the other companies, which is a acts as two truck companies, a rescue, they have to go and rescue those people. Okay. So what they do is... They'll throw ladders. Uh, we have park cars around it, and we call that alternative healing because where we work, there's some places where uh, the cars are parked up underneath windows, sure. and you may have to go through the windshield to make the grab. So we'll show them how to do alternative healing, but in the drill, you know, we'll have people hanging out of the windows at the car, and you're pretty much by yourself. 
So you're throwing this, say, 20-foot roofer into a car window having to make the grab by yourself. And that is, that's tiring. Uh, and now you do that over and over and over. And the reason why is we're trying to build that good muscle memory in you. And to where there's no obstacle that you can't overcome at the end of that drill right. or at the end of the day. And, you know, if you look at the Paxton Hotel, what those guys were encountering, they were overwhelmed. You know, I mean, they had people hanging out the windows and they were having to make the decisions of which got, which person are we getting first, right. depending on the conditions of what the person was in. So we took that, we added some things to it, and that is our final drill of the day is the Paxton drill. Nice. Very nice. There you go. I was losing you. You're slipping off the bottom. I was like trying to frame you back up. Yeah, I was, I was, that's the emotional <laughs> you get, hijack. That's where you get passionate, man. That's where you get passionate. You know, you start slipping <laughs> off the screen. Dude, I love it, man. Uh, the Paxton drill. Someone mentioned it up here. Megan Smith chimed in and was talking about uh, dark side of ladders was one of the most beneficial classes I've ever attended, especially the Paxton drill. Thank you, OJ and magic city. So anyway, they were already mentioned it earlier. So, uh, Kelsey Trotty said note to self, Google Paxton hotel fire. Absolutely. I'm going to do it when we get off here. So moving on, uh, number four, what mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Uh, uh there's been a couple, <laughs> there's more than one. Um, you know, be humble. Don't, don't ever think that you know everything because once you start thinking, Oh, okay, I got this down. Uh, something's going to come up and bite you. And that is, that is the one thing that I learned growing up through the fire service. You know, you start getting to a point like I've been to so many fires. Uh, I've done this, I've done that. What else can you throw? And you get that one thing and it humbles you. And once I got that one thing, I was like, you know what? I don't know everything. I'm not ever going to know everything. So I, I was very humbled by it and I, I stay humbled by it. Uh, the second thing is if you're looking to uh, own one of these training companies, again, vet your instructors right thoroughly. On. Right on, dude. And, and dude, I love that. Um, absolutely. Uh, final question. Heavy fire and searchable space. Would you rather be assigned? I think I know the answer, but I'm just I'm gonna I'm gonna continue with the question. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Uh, we'd rather. Okay, so now that I've been promoted, I'm I'm on an engine. Uh, oh, okay, okay. When I was riding the truck, yeah. When I was riding the truck, I was. Uh, uh, I'd love to have been first in on VES, especially the crew that I had. Right. Um. Uh, you know, I I. Again, I trusted them, uh, and I knew they were going to get the job done. Now, being assigned to the engine uh, for right now, it's, uh, I don't know. I think I'd still rather do the yes, <laughs> even on the engine. <laughs> I love the answer, man. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and the full, the full range of, of reasons why max points on number five, uh, Brian Schaub said, and I want to bring this up. There's the, there's the five questions for firefighters according to OJ Kaloje. So, uh, but Brian Schwab said this, and I, I wanted to bring this up earlier and I'm glad that Brian mentioned it because, uh, what I think should be mentioned is the fundraising that magic city guys does. They raise money for firefighters. They're having a family crisis or for fallen firefighters. Great jobs, including a monstrous raffle that just went down. Correct. Yeah, we uh, we were able to raise uh, forty thousand dollars for St. Louis and uh, the families in Baltimore. Fantastic. Uh, Clay McGee, he is our spokesperson for it. He handles the raffles. Uh, he'll get out there with his video, and people just draw to his monotone voice. I don't know really what it is, but they do. And he'll handle of dulling of giving out the prizes. All I do is just sign the check. Right on. And. Uh, so I give him, you know, hundred. He'll come and hey, we need to do this. Hey, we're going to do it. So yeah, we've we've been doing that for a couple of years. Uh, we've so far we've been able to raise right around sixty four thousand dollars for injured uh, police and fire. Badass. Uh, we've raised uh, with our Deep South Conference. We raised ten thousand five hundred dollars for our burn camp, uh, and we're having Deep South again this year. And all the proceeds go to the burn camp. So my thing is the fire service, 
or public safety has been so good to me throughout my life. Um, there's no other way to give back, but try to help those that are in need. So that's what we do. Awesome, man. Unbelievably awesome. I love it. Ah, oh, beautiful. Okay. So let me know how can people get a hold of you? How can they book? Oh, well, I had another question here that came up and said, is magic city truck school magic is magic city trucks is magic city school an annual event around a certain time. Is that a thing or no? Uh, actually we'll come to you. Oh, that's uh, what I thought. I didn't know if there was a, a specific event he was referencing. So no, no. Uh, okay. I guess he's talking about when we talk about the five day class. Uh, no, we, we can come to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, we don't really do much in our state anymore. We're really out of state now. So uh, we will tailor it to what your department is. Um, so we will, we'll go everywhere. Awesome. And which leads me to how can people get a hold of you? What's the best way to book a class, reach out to you, get in touch, ask a question, etc. cetera. Uh, <laughs> I'm a horrible communicator <laughs> and I think, I think the guys will, I, I think you'll contest that. Uh, you can text me. Uh, my number is 205-383-8943. Uh, shoot a message on uh, messenger, but probably the best way is to shoot a message on, on Facebook. Uh, I, I definitely will see that. It's a horrible habit I have. And to be honest with you, I don't know how we're still in business because <laughs> I am a horrible communicator. Uh, but those are the main ways that you can get a hold of me. Perfect. There you go. Uh, there it is. 126 scraps in the books. OJ, cool J. That's what someone said in there, so I had to say <laughs> it. Um, uh, if you love the scrap, support uh, the scrap, firehousevigilance.com. Go there. There's shirts. There's merch. There's books. There's uh, coins. Uh, hats are in in popular colors. It, I can't get loading. I can't get camo, but we're working on it. Uh, next up, I'm going to try and find um, – Next up is Chad Daly, so that's exciting. Uh, and then following Chad, we got Nick Esposita, and then Steve Stawecki, followed by Mike Galliano. So it's shaping up to be a exciting end of February into March. It's going to be a good time. Uh, you can I'll be at Orlando Fire Conference next week, and then of course I will see my friend OJ at uh, North Florida Fire Expo. If you see me out there. Uh, Get uh, Mutts Don't Scrap pictures. I love them. I love them. I'm terrible at asking for them. So uh, it was awesome down at Pensacola. I think I'm, I'm going to make a post as soon as I can uh, organize how many pictures we took and, and put the names in the departments with everybody. So it is coming. Um, too many coins right now to mess with today. Uh, I do want to talk about the Mutts Don't Scrap Taylor's Tins. I didn't set it over here by my computer. It might be hanging up there back in my collection. But the Mutts Don't Scrap, Taylor's Tins. It is the tin of the month. So go out there, support Taylor. It, all the all the proceeds from those uh, go to the uh, next rung and Blake's Tenant and what they do for supporting firefighters everywhere. So go support that. Get the Yeah, you can see it right up there behind my head. The Mutts Don't Scrap tin. Let me see if I can point backwards. Right <laughs> there, there. The Mutts Don't Scrap tin. Get it. And uh, support Next Rung and support that uh, completely. None of the money goes to me at all. It is all about Next Rung. And I think that's all I've got. OJ, I had a blast, my friend. And that was a lot of fun. I sure do appreciate you bringing me on, brother. I, I really want to try and, and try out this, this scaling ladder. Well, if so, you're going to be in Florida, I'll, I'll make time for you. Okay. I will, I, <laughs> as long as there's no cameras around. I'm not sure how I can, I'm not sure how I do on the vertical. I don't want to tempt fate. Oh uh, man, absolutely. Uh, you'll be good. Uh, thank you guys for your questions, comments. Uh, as always, the audience is what makes the scrap so much fun. Uh, I hope the tone stays silent unless it's burning. Everybody stay safe out there.